Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of the prob- troubles. I'm on page 62. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that sometime in the past we've made decisions based on self, which later places a position to be hurt. I always look, I almost can go back to every position I was in when I, I felt like I got hurt and see where I set the ball rolling. Very rarely can I see that I ever really did do anything. And there are times, but it's very rare. I mean, I, I, there were some things, but even, even at some of these places, I still can find somewhere I set the ball rolling by something. It says, so our choices we think are basically of our own making. And that's probably the best news that I got. Because if my problems are my own making, then there's a solution. But if my problem's my mom, I'm screwed because my mom may never change. I mean, she's 77. It's a safe bet she's not going to come to AA and work a spiritual program. She could. I'm open. But I just don't see it on the horizon. So somewhere I'm going to meet my mom where she's at. So my problems are of my own making. My in- unwilling to accept people exactly where they're at. I have an idea of how you should be acting, and you're not acting accordingly. In fact, I found a great way never to get another resentment. Let's just come up with cards in the morning, and I'll just hand them out to everybody that's going to meet me. So you're going to be driving out on you know, I-35 today, and this is how I want you to respond when I come by. I don't want you going. You're going way too slow. The lady at the cash register that's reaching in to sign to write a check for the pack of gum, like, no, 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 I'm going to be behind you. You can't write a check. You need to come up with some change. <laughs> right? Like, seriously, because that's my pro- those are my problems, right? Really, lady, you're writing a check for gum, and you don't even know where your check is. You had to wait all the way to get there and then go to the <laughs> You couldn't get your check and be prepared? Come on! Do you know how important I am? What's wrong with you people? The lady, they, they don't merge right. It's like ridiculous. I mean, that's my problem. Those are like real problems to have. Right? I mean, I'm like the worst. I'm my worst enemy sometimes. And when I'm really spiritually fit, and I don't really care what's happening. I'm just like, whatever. I'm just like walking through life. My wife, I'm a high-strung guy, just so you know. I don't have to do that, but. So imagine me untreated. Yeah, I was kind of crazy. You know, I'm not kind, I just was. So they arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self will run riot. Self will run riot. Swerve. I, the guys who I sponsor know me now that I say, ah, swerve, dude. Totally. Self will run riot. You put a stamp on their back. S W. Right? R R. Swerve. That's what we are. We're self will run riot. And I don't even think I am. Though he usually doesn't think so. <laughs> Above everything, we alcoholics must be really selfishness. What? We must or it kills us. Really? That seems extreme. <laughs> I mean, now they're throwing out the killing thing. It kills me. But I, I believe it's true. God makes up. And here's how it kills me. Because I live in self. I drink more. It kills me through alcoholism. It's not like God strikes me dead with lightning. You're selfish. I've been died a long time ago, trust me. God makes that possible, and there often seems no way I'm tired of getting rid of self without his aid. And that's been true. The only way I can get rid of self is through the 12 steps in God. It's the only thing that's ever worked for me. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Anyone ever do that? Like, I just wish, I had a friend, like, man, if I was just like Jim Rollison, because he was something, he had it so together. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. The teachers loved him. Girls loved him. You know, I mean, he was just like everybody liked him, and he was really polite, and he never gossiped about anybody. He was just a really kind guy, and I just like, God, I should be like Jim. He was always caring about other people. I could never get to him. I wanted to be. I did not want to become the guy I became. I did not, like, wake up and say, man, I didn't want to be a bank robber. I didn't like, well, I'm going to be a bank robber. That's what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? I'm going to work for the fire department. What are you going to do? I'm going to rob banks. It's not how I intended my life to be. And, you know, even when I was younger and I was like, why am I doing that? I couldn't get out of my own way. No, you're keeping me awake. That is really appropriate. Don't worry about it. You don't need to apologize. I do apologize. Well, okay. I accept your apology. 
<laughs> I accept it because you gave it. You don't need to, but I just accept it. Neither could we reduce our self centered as much by wishing or trying our own power. We had to have God's help. The question is, do I believe that? Do I believe that the change and the transformation can only come through my higher power? If I answer no, then i got to figure out, well, okay, then how are you going to change yourself? I'll get a new girlfriend, get a new job, get a new car. I'll go get a master's degree. Then I'll get my PhD. I'll do this, I'll do that. I'll make more money, I'll do this. You know, I'll learn to ski backwards. That'll work. You know? I'm, it's sad because I, I taught my kids how to ski early, and I, I watched them ski backwards. I'm like, wow, I never learned how to ski. I, I, I started skiing really late in life. So now I'm brittle, you know, and they're pliable. The scariest experience I ever had, my daughter skied into a tree in front of me. Ooh. You want to talk about, yeah, it was pretty, you know, it was a moment when I realized, uh, you want to know what powerlessness is? Is we were skiing at night, we were night skiing in Camden, Maine, and we'd been skiing all night. And they had, I don't know why they had this big tree right in the middle of the slope, and they didn't have any, like, uh, padding around it. But it was so big, and it was on a flat spot, it came down, and then flat, and then went down again. And they ran the lights, because they used to do night skiing, they ran the lights to it. That's why they never got rid of it, because it was like a standing point. And I'm skiing, and my wife, I mean my daughter, my daughter, we're skiing, and we've been doing this. We've been skiing down, and then we go around, and it's a big tree. It's bigger than this. You know, it's like a big tree. It's not like a... And we were just having to be going down, and the lift, and she was looking up at one of her friends, and I kind of caught, like, oh, no, and I looked, I said, Quincy Tree, and then by the time I said that, she hit it, and I would skied by it. Oh. And, you know, and I all I could see, and it's kind of dark, all I could see is her skiing, and she turned, I mean, she hit it full speed, and I, I couldn't get my boots off, like, before I even stopped, I was out of my boots, and I ran, and she was passed out, and then the ski patrol lady was there, she was just waking up, and she didn't know what happened, and, there, and not, she didn't break anything, that was the ultimate powerlessness, she had a side of her face, she, she turned right at the last moment, and took the impact here, and her thing pulled a uh, mark out of her goggles, I don't know why I told you that story, but anyway, it was really one of those moments of like, total powerlessness. That's how life is so precious, you know, like I'm real clear. Uh, in fact, this came out of that. Uh, it was uh, going skiing with her. About a week later, she wanted to go skiing again. And I, I mean, I'm like, okay, we'll go. And I was going up to Sugarloaf, or uh, Saddleback. She's like a two-hour trip. It was just going to be me, me and her. And I realized she never really knew. She doesn't know my story. And I sponsor all these guys from prison. And... Uh, I remember telling Chloe, I said, I think I need to tell Quincy my story. I think I need to know. She's going to find out. She's, she was eight years old. I think she's going to figure it out. You know, all these guys come around and they, you know, they tell stories about me. So uh, I went up to the room and I was saying, hey, babe. I said, no, I'm just packing. And I go, I just want to tell you something. And so she's standing in front of me and I said, uh, so I'm going to tell you something about your dad that you, know, that you can't tell your little brother. But you need to know. So I told her, I said, you know, when I was in my 20s, uh, I robbed banks and I went to prison. And I went to prison for seven years. And this is why I know that God's working through me and my wife. Because she started to cry. And she looked at me and she said, uh, you know, I'm like, I don't know what she's thinking. Because I'm thinking maybe she thinks I'm not, like I'm not her hero anymore. And I said to her, I said, what's up? What's going on? And she said, and tears were just rolling out of her eyes. And she said, you must have been so lonely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what she was thinking, that I was so lonely. And I was like, yeah, baby. And then she came and she said, is that why you go to the prison every week? Like, she knew. And I said, yeah. And she just gave me a big hug. She said, I love you. And uh, now that's not, that's not like... When I think of that, I think, God, you know, where does that come from? You know, like, that's not how I thought at her age, you know. And that's that's a God deal there. You know, like, she sees the work we do. You know, I don't yell at my kids. I haven't yelled at my kids. I mean, I'm firm with them, but I don't yell. I haven't raised, I haven't raised my voice to my wife in 16 years. Like, I haven't had an argument with my wife beyond the level that we're talking right here in over 16 years. Because when I was about three, four years sober... We had a real doozy of a fight. I remember slamming the door and I said, F you, you know, and I walked out to my truck and started crying. I'm like, I don't be that guy. And I 
And I got real quiet with God and I came back in. And I said, I'm never, ever going to disrespect you in that way. I will never raise my voice to you. And so for the last 16 years, I've never raised my voice to my wife. And my daughter's 11. She's never seen me disrespect her mother. So for 11 years, my daughter has watched how a man treats a woman. And so when she starts dating, God forbid, when she starts dating, <laughs> and she meets some guy who raises his voice to her or disrespects her, she's going to know that's not how my dad treated my mom. That's not how a man treats a woman. And what I think is even more important, if not more, at least equal, is my son knows how to treat a woman. And I never knew that. Like, my dad and my mom would fight. Like, it would be like, game on. And what I learned is my son's going to walk, he's going to grow up into understanding how men treat women. I mean, don't confuse that we don't have differences, because we do have differences. We have disagreements. But when it says we practice these principles in all our affairs, that means when I'm having a disagreement with my wife, she sees a black wall and I see a white wall, and we are, not, we are in an impasse, we can't get there that we get there with God. And we will sometimes say, let's bring God into this discussion because you know what? I have something going on and you have something going on. And I love this woman to my, I mean, to my core. I think it's very important because the people around us are watching. I mean, I see it in my neighborhood. I, you know, just the other night, my neighbors were shooting at each other. It was brutal. Brutal. And their kids were right around them. I'm like, my kids never get to see that. And I didn't understand. They go, why are they yelling at you? And I'm like, this is how they want to talk. We don't communicate that way. No judgment. Just not what we do. All right? We had to have God's help. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is not about me, because there's no way I could communicate like that. No way. In my house, whoever yelled the loudest won the argument. That's how it worked. <laughs> and I usually realized that was fear-based. I'm afraid of not getting what I want. So I'll yell louder. But not if this is the woman of my dreams. Not really. So this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. All right? Quit playing God. And this is the third step. This is the third step right here. And because next we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. And so that's the keystone. That locks it in. All right? Let me tell you. That's the third step, key. This is the second, the cornerstone. All right? I like to look at it like this. If I think that I'm a child of God, then everybody's a child of God. And God doesn't have any grandkids. So my kids are children of God. God doesn't go to me and then to them. He goes through me to them, through him to them, eventually. Right now, I may be a conduit, but the truth is, God doesn't have any grand. they got their own relationship with God. And that really makes me feel okay. I'm comfortable with that. There's a lot of freedom in that. Also, when I started sponsoring guys who uh, I didn't like, uh, I realized that they're children of God. Trust me, you'll sponsor someone you don't like. <laughs> Chandler, I'm not talking about you. Stop it. It's going to happen. But it really makes it really easy for me. When I get frustrated with someone, I can realize that this, is, this person's a child of God. How can I be mad at that? And so my idea is God is my father. Now, in prison, the guys are like, get, they get in trouble with that because someone had an abusive father. So if you had an abusive father, you're not going to want to think that. But here's what, I, what, here's what I challenge them to. I said, well, what type of father are you? How do you think of your children? I love my kids unconditionally. Because see, here's the deal. I know that no matter what my kids do, I will always love them. There is a love from a parent to a child which is indescribable. That's why Jeffrey Dahmer's mom visits him in prison. She's like, oh, I know you eat people, honey. It's okay. Like there's a love there that just, it's insurmountable. I never understood unconditional love. Until I had my daughter. Never felt it. Never once felt it. There was always a condition to our love. There's a condition to my love with Chloe. 
Seriously, for us to be, I mean, she could break that trust, and we, I could fall out of love with her. I could never fall out of love with my kids. And if I think of I'm a child of God, then God loves me that way no matter what I do. I'm sure he's disappointed in some of the things I made, and I'm sure it makes him sad that I choose to live myself in self-will. Just like when my kids do something that I see as self-will run riot, it makes me sad because I know they're going to run into themselves. But it doesn't mean I love them any less. And I'm comfortable in that. So that's the, that's the decision I make, that he's my father and I'm his child. And it's okay. You can figure out whatever works for you. And then they give you promises. There's six third step promises, as I see them. There could be more, there probably is, but these are the six I see. Papa 30, uh, 63. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. Number one, we had a new employer. Well, that's good, right? Do we need a new employer? Yeah. Who was the old employer? Yeah. Me, and I failed it. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work, well, well, there's something. The steps are not the work. The 12 steps are not the work. The work is carrying this message to his kids. The steps prepare us to do the work. So I had to remove that concept. The steps are not the work. The steps are the process that prepares me to go do God's bidding. That's what it prepares me for. That's number two. Number three. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. That sounds like the opposite of page 61, doesn't it? Four. More and more we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. That's a good one. Five. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind... Enjoy peace of mind. That means having one thought at a time. Yikes. <laughs> really? <laughs> you want to be able to get them. You can't. It, it meditation will be very hard if you cannot enjoy peace of mind. Because meditation is peace of mind. Okay? As we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. And that's good because guess what? I only need to be present here. This is where God lives. He doesn't live yesterday. He doesn't live tomorrow. He lives here, right now. Get present today, right here. Even if you're tired right now, get present. Because you're going to miss out. Chandler, thinking about work tomorrow is not going to save you. Get present. Immigration bill can wait. Seriously. It's not here. It's not in your iPhone. Present now. Man, when I get present like that, man, I'm on fire. You want to talk about being an effective leader. I can be an effective leader. When I'm present for my team, I can lead them places, and they will follow. I have people that are 100% convinced I'm leading them down the right path, that they will follow me. They will take directions. And not only that, but they want to follow me, and they're really excited about life. They're really excited about what we do. Because I'm present for them. When they come in my office with something, I don't, I don't sit there and type an email and listen to them. I stop what I'm doing. I look them in the eye and say, give me what you got. And so they know I'm present. Say with my kids. I'm not on Facebook when my kids are talking about what happened at school. I shut it off. And it's so hard today because there's so much technology, we can easily get distracted. Shut it off and get present for your people. I mean, now it's even harder today than it's ever been. Checking in. <laughs> Brian's at dinner with the family. I really want you to eat. <laughs> you know. We were reborn. That's a scary one. All the guys who are afraid of being a born again Christian are like, whoa, stop. <laughs> Game over. I don't want to be reborn. Oh, then just continue doing what you've been doing. Well, I don't want to do that. Oh. <laughs> so maybe reborn doesn't look like the way I think it looks like. Because my impression of reborn is all different than what they're talking about. A personality change is, a re is reborn. See, here's what I was afraid of. Who am I going to become? You do your four-step. You won't find out who you are in your four-step. You never will. You'll find out who you're not. And you find out who you're not, you can really become who you're supposed to be. Because I was just a big lie. You know, I'm not a gangster. Like, I'm not, I'm not a gunslinger. I mean, I robbed drug dealers before, you know, but I'm not a tough guy. I'm not I'm a desperate act of a desperate man. 
That's not who I am. I don't like putting guns in people's faces. That's not what I dig. You know, I'm not that guy. It's not me. Man, I'm a softie, man. I, I, my kids, I, my kids see me shed more tears than, than their mom, I'll tell you that. Because I'm open to God's presence. That's just how I am now. I, I think a lot of it has to do with I shut off emotionally for so long that once I open it up, it just can't stop. And I'm okay. Like, I'm okay with it. Just who I am, man. Just deal with it. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make me less than. It doesn't make me more than. It doesn't make me more authentic, less authentic. It doesn't even mean anything except that's just what's going through me at that moment. I'm really okay with that. I don't really worry what people think about me in that arena. So I was okay to be reborn. So then we do the third step. Now, if I'm sponsoring you, we're going to kneel and do this third step together. We're going to say the prayer, and then we're going to talk about the prayer. So we do a third step as a group. You guys want to do that? Sure. Yeah. So, now I've done this. When I first started taking groups, I was talking about groups of guys in the prison. I was a little hesitant because, you know, like, there's like 18 guys and they're all like tattoos, FTW in their forehead, and, you know, snakes on their neck and, you know, teardrops and, you know, they got hate on their knuckles. And, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is going to be weird. So I said, uh, so I told them the very first group I ever had was only a small group, but the, well, the first big group, more than 10 guys. And there's a window, like windows like this, that people, you know, guys from lot going to the gym, inmates could see them. And I said, so here's how we do it. We kneel and we pray. And I said, or we can just do the prayer together. And they said, well, how do you do it on the streets? I told them we kneel and we pray. They said, well, let's do it that way. I never had one group, probably the 50 groups I ran, that at least got to the third step, not one of them. And all that time ever said, let's don't do it, let's just do it. And these guys would do it, man. And I had some amazing experience. We get into the 12 step. I'll tell you what an amazing spiritual experience I had while doing that. A vision. I don't get visions. Like, I'm not a vision kind of guy, but I had a vision that night, that day. It was pretty powerful. So you guys want to do this prayer? Yeah, do it. All right, let's do it. Circle up. I don't know. We got to move some chairs back. I'm in the perfect position here. <laughs> yeah, man. Might as well, Neil. Why not? I got... Well, you can work around it if you have to. Do you know how to do a third step prayer? Do you know the third step? If you do not know the third step prayer, bring your book with you and put it near your knees. I am diminutive. You can have the chairs. Circle. We can do it. We can do it. I know it. No, we could do. <laughs> Three of us can play out. He's never failed. Hey, it can be a serpent time. Uh, that circle's irrelevant. It's about being linked. Yeah, baby. Everyone needs to be linked. Find the link. You gotta do it. There you go. Yeah, she Doesn't have to be perfect, just needs to be linked. So say everyone just take a moment. God, I want myself to be to deal with me and do with me as I will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away, away my difficulties, that victory over them may wear with those that would help, but the power, the love, and the way of life. May I do their will always. Amen. All right. All right, let's go up and talk about this prayer. Now, it's just a prayer, right? And what is a prayer? Anyone know what the definition of prayer is? Talking to God. Talking to God. Making a commitment. Here's what I like about this prayer. Now, there's no amen at the end of this prayer, even though Dave said amen. There is no amen. Which is always weird. I was like, why is that? It doesn't really matter. Amen is so be it. So that the word amen just means so be it. So I don't really care. A lot of people say the, step, the next amen is on seven step. And they'll say the third step through the seventh step is one continual prayer. 
So I, I'm okay with that, too. I don't think anyone really knows. No one's done a seance with Bill Wilson yet to find out what he's thinking. <laughs> we may do one tonight, but uh, we don't really know. I like to think that this prayer is a continuation. It never ends. So I don't care. So be it. doesn't really matter to me. I just know this. This is a prayer I use every day. Every day I use this prayer. So this is what it says. God, help myself to thee to build with me and do with me as I will. Basically, my life's no longer my business. So I just show up and suit up, man. I, I'm, I'm open. I'm not, like I'm on the court. Let's play. I've never been on the court. I'm on the court now. Wherever it takes me, I'm go. I'm good. It says, relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better thy will. I can't do God's will when I'm consumed with my will. When I'm so invested in what I'm getting out of life, there's no way I can live in God's presence. It's all about me, 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 me. So I have to get rid of, I'm the problem. I gotta get free of myself. Okay? Take away my difficulties that victor with them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. I mean, truthfully, when you speak at an AA conference or an AA event or even an AA meeting, you're bearing witness. When someone asks you for help, they come to your house or wherever and you open this book, you bear witness to them of what's possible. What is possible? I mean, there's guys, I see it all the time. It's like, oh, I can't get a job. Because, you know, I have, I'm, I got a record. I'm like, hey, over here. You know, like, whatever. You know, when the state of Maine licensed me as a foster parent, you know, that's impossible. If you live in the, impo- you know, I live in the possibilities. I don't live in the impossible. I never lived in, I, I mean, my, my cup is like always half full. Even when I didn't have a cup, my cup was half full. I mean, but you've got to live in the possibilities of life. I mean, I, I tell guys all the time, like, you know what? You're only defeated by the language you have about you, you're an ex-convict. So what? Why don't you go and tell the story to someone? Say, hey, you know, I made some bad mistakes, ended up in prison for 10 years, but I want to improve my life and I want to be a better man. I'm ready to show up, man. You give me a job, I'll be your best damn worker. You'd be surprised. People are like, all right, slow down there, chief. Come on. <laughs> and then you show up. I always showed up early and stayed late. All the guys crying about how much money I made? Why does Brian get all the accounts? Because I earned them. Guys would say that in sales meetings. Why does he get all the accounts? I'm like, dude, I, because I'm here at 8 o'clock, you come in at 9, and I'm here at 5, and you leave at 4. You figure it out. You want to show up for life? Don't complain about it. It doesn't seem fair. Oh, yeah, it doesn't. We thought, well, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should write inventory on those guys. <laughs> yeah. We thought well before making the step, making sure we were ready that we could at least abandon ourselves earlier than him. So the third step for me is, you know, the care of God is really nice. Because I was under the care of Brian, and Brian really wasn't very nice to me. Right? We found it very desirable to take the spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. I pray with my wife, I think it's important. Pray with your significant other. See if that works. It's kind of cool. You have kids, it starts to go away because you're always running and chasing like, kids around. But man, for a long time, my wife and I, we had a lot of we had a lot of rituals that we did. I mean, if you ever look at the word spiritual, right? Just look at the word spiritual, and uh, we always look at one part of the word. We always look at this word, spirit. But I like to look at this word here because there's a world in spiritual called ritual. Nobody ever talks about that. They always talk about the spirit end of it. I get some ritual going on in my spiritual activities. Okay? But it's better to meet God alone than one who might misunderstand. The wording was, of course, quite optional so long as we expressed the idea of voicing our reservation. I've had guys want to write their own third step. You know, my buddy the monk had to make his own third step. (laughs) And I let him because it says to, so I'm not going to argue with him. I asked him, I said, well, I think you should ask yourself why you find it necessary to do that. If you're doing it just because you think it's important, it's fine. But I think maybe you should look at why you think that's important to you. And be honest and check your motives on that. And he came back and said, you know, my motives are pure. I said, okay. He said, that's good. You know, he's a man of the cloth. The small. It's like an art project. This was only a beginning. No, honestly and humbly made an effect. Sometimes the very great ones felt at once. I didn't feel a very great effect on my first third step. I just did. Here's what I did feel. About three or four days later, I felt this presence that maybe I was on a different path. That's what I did feel. I had a moment of like, hmm, life is a little different. I didn't feel much different, but I thought maybe 
The only time I had a really strong spiritual experience, I've had two. One with a guy named Ron Pendleton, who, you remember him. He's a real hard case. He has F-U tattooed, you know, but the whole word on the inside of his lip, so when he pulls it down, he could, you know, tell you what he thought. That type of guy. Yeah, he's a hardcore guy. I mean, he has a commitment. I met him uh, because he came out of rehab, and someone said, you need to find Brian because he had spent some time in prison for armed robbery. He robbed a liquor store so he would go to prison so he could kill the guy who killed his sister. That was his plan. And what he failed to understand is that they didn't send him to that prison. They sent him to another one. <laughs> he wasn't the brightest boy. He was a good guy, but he was like a he was a hot wire. And, uh, I mean, someone, had, this guy, had, uh, his sister's husband killed you know, domestic violence and was doing life in prison. And so he got drunk one night and decided to go rob a liquor store. He said, you know, if I get caught so what, I'll just go to prison, I'll kill him. And he would have. He was that type of guy. But I did a third step with him. I felt the true presence of God. Fifth step with him, I felt the presence of God. I'll tell you a fifth step story when we get to the fifth step because it really, it was tra- it's, it was huge. And, uh, but I, didn't, I don't put a lot of emphasis on how you felt or what happened. Just do it, right? Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, page 64, which many of us never attempted. How many people here in this room have never done a four step? Raise your hand. If you have yet to do a four step, raise your hand high so I know who we're talking to. Okay. Now, besides those two, who's not done a four step out of the big book? Okay. All right. Cool. Who has not done it out of the big book? You have done it out of the big book. I mean, there, there are other ways to do four steps. I mean, they're not really four steps. There's just other ways to do inventories. I only know one way out of the big book. Uh, <laughs> He's not going anywhere. Hi, <laughs> brother. We're not going to. We're good. No, I'm going to mess with this big guy. <laughs> yeah, he's controlling the air conditioning, man. I don't want to mess with that guy. Is he? I love that. Those are some of my best people. I love those people. Because really deep down, he's a teddy bear, isn't he? Yeah. Isn't he? We know. Come on. Yeah. So our decision was a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless it once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. So that's the deal. Well, I got to get rid of the things that are blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. What? So we had to get down to cause and conditions. My sponsor was notorious for saying this. This is a this is one of my funnest lines. He said... In, in A in Tucson, they would always say, you know, someone bring up a problem, like, oh, I'm really depressed. And everybody would say, oh, this too shall pass. You ever hear that in AA? This too shall pass? So whenever that got said, my, I knew. I was like, oh, Kenny, here comes Kenny. And he can't raise his hand. He was a cowboy, Kenny. He said, yeah, th- this too shall pass. But if you get down, if you don't get down to causes and conditions, this too shall return. <laughs> he was notorious for saying that and it was so funny like ah, this guy he was good I and mean, he wasn't a mean spirited guy he was a really kind guy but his truth was yeah it'll pass but it'll keep reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring and you don't want to make it about something else but it's about you so we got to get down to cause and conditions therefore we started upon a personal inventory this was step four look they italicized it there we are step four so now we're at step four and they talk about a business they give a business analogy I just want to say if I own a business, if I own like uh, Shorty P's uh, supermarket, and I had like rotten fruit, like you came down my fruit aisle, there was like r- rotten fruit, fruit flies everywhere, and bananas are black, and then you went down my meat aisle, and there's like maggots on my meat and stuff, and all the milk was clumpy. I mean, would you ever come back to my place? You wouldn't come back. And so why doesn't Shorty P go out there and clean that stuff out? What's keeping Shorty P from going and cleaning out all that stuff? This delusion then I'm going to sell it. Because if I have to really admit that it's rotten, i got to throw it away, and it's going to cost me. Like people do this. they got bills they haven't paid. This is usually when you're actively drunk, right? You take the envelope, and you throw it in a drawer, and you close the drawer. You ever do that? You just keep hiding your letters? Like, you don't want to see it. Somehow, you believe if you don't look at it, it's not real. <laughs> like, really? It's still real, whether you look at it or not, because it's in an envelope, and it got mailed to you. But somehow this delusional thinking, we just keep hiding it and hiding it and hiding it. It's kind of like when you make you make a commitment to make a phone call to someone and you don't make it. And then you then you're like a week goes by and you're like, oh, I should have called. And then you can't make the phone call because you're embarrassed to make the phone call. So you don't make the phone call and it gets worse and worse. And now you've gone like a month without calling that person. I should have called that person a month ago. And then you run into them at an A and B like, hey, dude, my bad. I mean, you know. But you don't want to call them. It's like, oh, just call them. Get over with it. Like we avoid reality so much. Inventory is the same way. Shorty P doesn't look at his inventory because he doesn't want to admit 
anything's fault. Inventory's like this. It's a, it's basically, it's a, when you really want to get down to it, it's just discovery. Just discovery. What's my life? What's really my life? And so we do it. In the inventory here, they do, they do three inventories. They do resentment, fear, and sex. And those are the three inventories that we talk about. That's the only one they give you. Resentment. Now, I'm not going to... I know there's people who haven't done it, so I'm going to briefly do one or two, but I'm not going to really get into it because I'm hopefully there's people in here that are going to be able to sponsor the people who haven't done it and they can teach them because I don't want to get caught up in it. But I will tell you this. There's a few that I walked into that I thought I would never get free of, and through the four-column inventory process, I was able to get free. Okay? So... I mean, really, it's like discover, uncover, discover, discard. That's really the truth of it. We uncover it, we discover what's true, we keep what's true, we discard the false, we have a new life. And that's how you can't get your character defects. How are you going to know what character defects unless you do an inventory of what my character defects are? All right, so you have to do it. It's a step you must do. I remember telling my sponsor after I did my third step, he gave me a notebook. I said, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to do a fourth step. It was really, I didn't really ask your opinion. <laughs> I said, okay, but I thought I'd give it to you. He said, I hear you, but you don't know what you're ready for. Like, you, you're not ready to not do a fourth step. Like, if the steps are going to get you sober, if that's the pathway, why would you want to not do it? That's like having cancer, and they say, you've got to do chemo. Like, I don't really know if I want to do chemo. <laughs> okay, well, if you don't do chemo, you're going to die. Like, well, I don't want to die. I just want to do chemo. <laughs> I'm going skiing next weekend. Really? You know, that's so important things. Come on, doc. Well, I'm giving you this. Okay. You don't do your chemo and you die. Well, you know, you should have done chemo. I mean, it's kind of an extreme example, but I'm telling you, like, that's what the steps are like. If the steps are a path to freedom, why would I want to wait to get better? This whole step a year thing, I don't, they don't even say it much anymore, but occasionally you'll see that, you know, just do a step a year. Or the first three steps, just do one, two, three for the first year. Like, I don't even know where they get that stuff from. Like, really? That's, like, painful. Like, why would I want to live in that? Right? Because it's a decision. Like, if I make a decision... Now, here's my decision. I've, I've decided that I'm going to fly back to Texas tomorrow. Now, Mark's going to do everything he can to get me to the airport. But guess what? If I don't go up and take action, like go and get my ticket and go through luggage and I'll go through the, the security. If I don't do that and get on the plane, I'm not home in Texas. So you can turn your life over to God through this prayer. But if you don't follow it up with action, you haven't done anything. You just, made a, you, know, you just made a decision without any action. decision without an action is just a waste of time. So go to the bottom where it says resentment. Resentment is the number one offender. Disregard what you read on the other page. Or above everything, selfishness. Just disregard that. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything. Why do you think it just destroys more alcoholics? Anyone know what I did? I mean, I know there's some of you guys who know. Give the answer. Well, yeah, we don't take care of them. But what do, what do resentments do? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if the sunlight of the spirit is, I, if that anything that blocks me from God is like dangerous, anything that blocks me from God, resentment really blocks me. I, I, I find that when I'm really resentful, I'm not in the presence of God. I'm in the presence of self. Okay, it destroys more alcoholics than anything. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we have been what they use a disease. Who said that? Who was talking about the disease thing? He used a disease. No, who was talking about Johnny H? Was it you? You should call Johnny and you say, Johnny. They use the word disease. Come on, Bub. Right? Am I not right, Bug Man? <laughs> he doesn't say alcohol is a disease. Oh, no, but he says spiritual disease. I'm just saying. It's just from its stem. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Split hair. I just saw the word disease. I know, I know. I use it. Hey, I'm with you. All right. From a small form of spiritual disease, for we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. You see the pattern? Spiritually straighten out, and then we get restored to sanity, and guess what? If we're restored to sanity, we don't ever drink, so we don't have to worry about the physical. And you look at the promises. The ninth step is the promises to the spiritual malady. The tenth step is the promise to the mental obsession, and then you don't ever drink again. And step 12 keeps you from going backwards. Okay, you guys get that path? All right. Even if you don't, just go with it. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. That means we have to write them out. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. So here's how I did it. My sponsor said, make a list of everybody you resent. So I have a piece of paper, all right, like this. 
I'm not using this one anymore. Here's my line notebook paper. And I was to make names Mom, Dad, God, uh, Tim, and my pro officer. I didn't like him. A guy named Ron, he ratted me out. Maybe the feds. No, I wasn't from Maine, so I had the feds, so uh, FBI, I didn't like the FBI. Uh, BOP, which is the Bureau of Prisons, I did not like them at all. So I had a whole list of people, institutions. I didn't have any principles on my first one. I don't know if I didn't have any principles because I didn't have any principles, or I just didn't have any principles, but I didn't have any principles. Principles are a little harder to catch, right? But principles are code of conduct, so resent, honesty, uh, there's all kinds of different principles you could talk about. But in the beginning, all, all I could do was people. So I was listing them all. He said, all I want is a list. It says, then we ask ourselves, why? So why do I have it? So that's the second column. Why do I have it? This is the first column. I was to take another piece of paper. This is the way I did it. Other people do it differently. I don't really care. It just formats the same thing. Big book goes left to right. I was ended up writing top to bottom. So I was to take my first name, Mom, and bring it over on this new page. And how many times, I, whatever resentments I had. Because sometimes you have more than one resentment. I may have ten resentments against my mom. So I write, mom, one, uh, divorced my dad. They remarried, but divorced my dad. <laughs> my parents were married three times to each other. Nice. <laughs> really? Yeah, they're, they're, not committed. they're committed. That's strong. <laughs> Don't commit. <laughs> divorced my dad. I mean, come on. When you Most people divorce when, when there's a, when a, when a, when a, Couple loses a child, there's a high divorce rate. So it really, really is a true fact. There's a higher divorce rate when that happens. But they went their way and then they got married again. Then they split. They didn't officially divorce the second time. They just kind of separated for a year and then they had a, a, re a recommitment to their vows in Hawaii. So they officially were only married twice, but they had three marriages. <laughs> divorced my dad. I cheated on my dad. I caught my mind. I knew she cheated. So I'm, you know, I don't know if my dad knew, but I knew. Um, wouldn't uh, let me come home. Can't believe it, you know. 29 years old, what's wrong with that? <laughs> grow up, dude. So I had a whole list. And then, then I do a couple lines. I do my dad. You know, I make his one, two. And I was just to do that on the front and back because I'm going to throw it away. And that's really how I made my list. First two columns were easy. I know who I resent. I know why I resent them. Not a big deal, right? So then it got a little hard. And I'm not really going to get into this too bad, but I just want to share one that, that I got because it really jammed me up. So I had this resentment against, uh, and I was the, when I was going to the third column, I have a whole new notebook now, and I got this whole 20 pages or 30 pages or 40 pages with all these names on my second column over here. This page is gone. Now I take these out, and I'm starting fresh, and this I'm not going to get rid of. And so I was to take the first two columns and put them up here. Uh, and I'm going to do this guy. I'm going to do this one because this one really jammed me up. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say family member. I mean, I know his name. I just want to put it down because it's irrelevant. Okay, plus it's okay. Whatever. Uh, molested. Okay, so this is the first column. This is the second. Now, the big book goes left to right, so if you turn this this way, it'd be the same thing. Family member. And then I was to draw a line in the middle. Now, this is going to be my third column. And this is my fourth, and we're going to get to that in a second. And so the third column was different, completely different, because I'd never looked beyond this. I'd only looked at him and what he did, her, what she did, them, and what they did. That's it. I never got any farther than that. And now I was to look at the third column. It said, we asked ourselves why we were angry, which is it. It says, in most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambition, our personal relationships, including sex, our sex relations, were hurt or threatened. Key word is hurt or threatened. I take every resentment and I say, was my self-esteem hurt or threatened when he molested me? Right? That's how I answer that question. We're burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal or sexual relations which have been interfered with? And then they list pride. So I look at seven things. Okay? I list seven things. Self-esteem, Emotional security, my ambitions, personal relationships, sex relationships, pride, and my pocketbook. Those are the seven things I'm looking. And I'm looking that were they hurt or interfered with. And so as I listed them, 
You guys can walk with me. Just tell me what you would think. So I got my lesson when I was 10. Do you think my self-esteem was hurt? Yes. So self-esteem. If I said yes, I was to write it down. Do you think my personal relationships were hurt or threatened with that? Yes. So I'd say personal relations. Do you think my sex relationships were hurt or threatened with that? Yes. Yeah. So I would sex relations. Do you think my pocketbook was hurt or threatened? No. It really did. Could. I mean, there could be, but it didn't for me. Do you think my ambitions were hurt or threatened? Yes. Yeah, like my ambition to trust people. Do you think my emotional security, my security was hurt or threatened? Do you think my pride was hurt or threatened? Okay, so everything but pocketbook on this one. Now, it does not say to do this. How many people in here have done extended third column? Extended third column means they write exactly how it hurt. Who raise your hand if you've never done that? I mean, hold on, sorry. Okay. Raise your hand if you've done it. Okay, so here's what I believe in. You don't have to do it. I don't think it's wrong or right. But my sponsor had me do extended third column because he said to me, he said, you know, it's okay that this, that you write self-esteem, but I want to know how, how, how did it affect your self, how did it hurt your self-esteem? And so I write. Now again, when I say this, if you haven't done this, it's not wrong, it's not right. I just did it because I was told to do it. But how did it, how did it hurt or threaten my self-esteem? Made me feel less than. And that would be all. Right? Nothing like that. How did it affect my personal relationships? I did not trust people. It's kind of hard to have authentic relationships when you don't trust people. How did it hurt or threaten my sex relationships? You know, and so forth and so forth and so forth and so forth. I'm not going to get into this. If you want to learn how to do it, we'll talk later. But I, And it really helped me in this way. I really got to see how my life was shaped by the actions of others. But truthfully, it doesn't say to do that in the big book. All right? So, let's just act like that didn't happen. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, I'm going to tell you. I was, this is going back 20 years, 1993. It helped me. I had a hard time identifying, but what I learned out of that exercise was really a lot of how I was as a man was shaped from actions of this and other people, other people's actions. I mean, I, my mom leaving me, same way. My mom, or my mom not letting me move in, move in home. So my mom wouldn't let me move home. Did that affect my self-esteem? Yeah, I felt like my mom didn't love me. Did that affect my personal relationships? Yeah, I was homeless. Hard to have friends when you're homeless. Did that affects your sexual relationship? Yeah, I was homeless. Girls aren't going out with homeless guys. You know, that affects your ambitions? Yeah, my ambition to not be homeless. Right? Did that affect your pocketbook? Yeah, I was homeless. I had to go out, you know, make money. Did that affect your emotional security? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to feel emotionally secure when your own mom doesn't want you. Did that affect your pride? Yeah, I was homeless. <laughs> so I saw this thing like, man, I was so, inv you know, I was so wrapped up with that. And so I did the whole third column like that. But really, to me, this is still the problem. This is all the problem. There's no solution in this. Yeah, so what? Yeah, I mean, this happened. That's true. But we got to get here to the fourth column. If we don't get to the fourth column, there's no freedom. Living up here is just living in the problem still. In fact, doing a third column, I actually was felt like, yeah, I've really been wrong. You know? No wonder I couldn't have a good relationship. I didn't know how to treat women. You know, like, oh, my God, I blame all my bad relationships on this. This is just like a victim place. But I have to go through victim to freedom. You have to go through the village of victim. You know, you got to go down that village. It's a fun village to live in. Some of us choose to live there for a long time. It's comfortable being a victim. Because guess what? For me, this, it explained a lot of stuff. I could, I could relapse and blame it on, you know, like, what? I've been molested. You know, like, I used it as a tool to basically keep people off my back. You know? I pull out the molestation card. That's like my Trump card. Bam! Yeah, what do you got there? I got molestation. What do you got? You know? Trump that. Responsible? Doesn't even get near it. Mom, well, nice try. You know? But, when I started doing a fourth call, and I got jammed up. So let's talk about how you get from three to four, because you can't get from the third to the fourth call easy. Alright? Because this right here, you gotta look at my mistakes. Try to leave the word my part out. 
use my part. Not that it's bad, it's just, I don't know. I like to use my mistakes. I think when you use my part, you're kind of still saying that they have a part. And I want to disregard the other person entirely. So I just look at my mistakes. Leave out the word my part. Okay? So, we're usually as definite as an example. And then they give you a bunch of examples. And go to the bottom of the examples. It said, we went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that the world and its people were often quite wrong. Yeah, I could say, yeah, I get that. Absolutely. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves, but the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these... Okay, now that got my attention. What? So what does that mean, that I'm permitting these? Did I permit this? I didn't permit that. So what am I permitting? The resentment. See, now, I know this happened, but so what? It happened. I have to get past that. So I, I, I'm responsible for my resentments. And I don't want to be responsible. I want to blame this guy or my mom or everybody else. Then we permit these. Do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Well, the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. Another warning. You may die of this. Okay? Third step. Selfishness may kill you. Now, fourth step. Resentment is going to kill you. I guess lots of death around here. All right? <laughs> For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit, which is what you guys talked about. The insanity of alcohol returns... And we drink again, well, that's to drink is to die. Frank Buckman knew that. The only thing is he was an alcoholic, but his resentments shut him off from the sunlight of the spirit, and he couldn't minister to people. And his very life was a minister. When you're a Lutheran minister, I think you go to, you know, you should probably be a minister. And to find that you can't minister to people, he shut off from the sunlight of the spirit. Well, that's we drink. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. Does that mean I never get angry? No, but I mean, anger's an emotion. People who say they don't get angry, I'm like, really? You don't get angry? Here, put your hand over here. Let me slam this hammer on it. <laughs> like, oh, that really hurt. I, please don't do that again. <laughs> like, right? I mean, the fact is, you're going to get angry. You're living life. How can you, unless you live on an island, you know? But even then, you know, like, Domino's doesn't deliver. You can get angry. Like, why doesn't Domino's deliver out here, man? <laughs> the crowd. I have no idea where that came from. I don't like Domino's. I don't even like Domino's. I don't even eat this stuff. But it just makes sense. All right? So just go with that. I told you yesterday I'm not responsible for anything I say. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. The grouch and the brainstorm. Man, the brainstorm was my head spinning out. Oh, I can't believe I can't believe he said that. Next time I'll say this. Like back and forth, this whole ping pong match. I'm playing this whole tape out of my head about man. Next time I'm going to say this, this, and this, and this. Oh yeah, you know. It's and the grouch. I'm not a grouchy guy, but I'm I'm kind of like a volatile guy. I'm not grouchy. I'm like I don't ever play that, you know. But I'm like a brainstorm, man. I just spin outside my head, right? I can't go there. They may be the dubious lecture of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. So we returned back to the list for a healthy key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Okay. We began to see that the world as people really dominated us. That really got my attention. See, what I've realized is that people have been owning me for a long time. Like, I let people, the bondage itself, I let people keep me in bondage. If you read Emmett Fox, if you read uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, so if you read Sermon on the Mount, and you read uh, Forgive Us Our Trespassers, if you read that phase in the back of the Lord's Prayer, some of the best information you're ever going to get about that, because what happens is you're going to find out that you're spiritually linked to the people you hate the most. So I'm 30 years old when I'm doing this inventory, and this guy molested me when I was 10. I plotted his death in prison. Like, a prison's pretty boring, so you get a lot of chance to brainstorm in prison in your bunk, right? Think about how I'm going to kill him. And I'm not talking like words. I'm talking about plotting a man's death. Like physically thinking, I should just kill him. Like consumed with anger. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancy to real, had power to kill. Fancy to real. 
You know how many resentments I had that were just made up stuff I had in my head? Does it make stuff up? I don't even know. A lot of my dishonesty when I get to the fourth column was, I don't even know that really happened. That was painful. So how can we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered. You must learn. If you want to live a free life in Alcoholics Anonymous, you must learn how to master resentments. And I, and I tell you, you master them by learning how to write inventory. And then you have to write them. But you can live in it. You can just live anger. Like, I love that anger. Justified anger. So, I love justified anger. Justified anger is, like, really fun. <laughs> you get the posse or he gets on your back. Yeah, you should be angry. You know, I don't have people like that. The posse I run with, they tell me, like, they cut me off. Like, dude, that's going to kill you. <laughs> you better have people in your corner who don't co-sign any of that. But that's what happens. We get a little posse. He said this, she said this, and everyone's like, yeah, man, yeah, man, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. That'll kill you. I wrap people around me and say, yeah, that happened, but, you know, what are you going to do with it? Because it's poison, brother. You want to be free or you want to die. Your choice. All right? We saw that these results must be mastered, but how we cannot wish away any more than alcohol. This was our course, and that are giving me a course. So here's the course. We realized that the people who were wrong were perhaps spiritually sick. I love that line. That was great. Yeah, they're sick. <laughs> Sick, 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 sick. You better when you tell them. Oh, yeah, you're just spiritually ill. <laughs> I resent you. I mean, you're just really, you're really spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way that they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, what? Like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help show them the same tolerance, pity, patience. That's a spiritual principle. That we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. That will be done. That's like 10-step stuff right there. In the moment prayer. Boom, boom, boom. Most of us can't get there. It's good to get there. But at this step, you know, most of these, they just own me. So we avoid retaliation argument. That's a spiritual principle. If you're looking for spiritual principles, there's a great one. We avoid retaliation and argument. How cool would that be? <laughs> right? All you guys who like to argue, you're like, I'm not so cool, dude. <laughs> We're not really invested in that, shorty P. Move on. <laughs> We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we just, if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Referring to our list again. Now I'm going back to the list. And this is the problem. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we resolu resolutely look for our own mistakes. So now I'm going to look for my mistakes. The only way I can get, the only way I can put the wrong they did and put it out of my mind is through prayer. So I take every resentment into a prayer. And the prayer is as simple as, God, help me set aside everything they've done and look at this from a whole completely different angle. Every one, every time. When I write inventory, I pray while I'm going into inventory, and I pray when I'm done writing inventory. If I don't pray on the way out of inventory, then I just walk around with this resentment still going. I have to pray on the way out. If a guy's writing inventory and they're suffering... And they're like all jammed up. I guarantee you they're not praying before they leave. I, I tell guys, if you write inventory, if you write inventory for five minutes, ask God to leave it in the notebook. Because you don't want to be dragging it around. Okay? So I was to pray every time for this. So then it says, where have we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? So there's four things we look at right there. There's one other thing I put down, but it's going to be controversial because it could be a rhetorical question, but I'm going to tell you what I do with it. So, Selfish, this is un you can't deny this because it says to do this. So this is not debatable. Where are we selfish? So where am I being selfish? Now I couldn't see it. I remember calling my sponsor up like, dude, I've written a lot of inventory and I got to this one I could not see. So I said to him, I said, you know what? I'm not digging this. He said, all right, tell me about it. I said, this guy molested me when I was 10 years old. I said, you want me to look where I was selfish? Dude, I was 10 years old. I, I didn't have anything to do with it. I wasn't selfish. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. How old are you now? So I'm yeah. 30. He said, so for 20 years, you've allowed this guy to continue to hurt you. So look at it from that angle. And so I got, I got it. So where have I been selfish? I use this as an excuse. In what? Lots of different ways. I, I use it as an excuse. Man. Where was I dishonest? What's the dishonesty? When I look at dishonesty, I look at the truth and the lie. What's the lie I tell myself? Well, the act is his fault. You're damaged. Yeah, I'm damaged. I am not 
whole. Because that's what I tell myself, I'm damaged. That's what the lie I tell myself. It's a lie. I'm not damaged, I'm just a guy who got molested. Okay, move on. I am not whole. What's the truth? I am whole. How do I self-seek? You know what self-seeking is? I look at self-seeking actions. Passive-aggressive, character assassination, slander, gossip. Those are self-seeking actions. Manipulation. So for me, I character assassinated them. I slander. Right? What's the fear? What am I afraid of? I think the fear was. Well, I kind of talked about it here, right? right. Should do it again. I'm damaged. Fear, fear of people finding out. Fear of intimacy. Right? Fear of trust. You know, you know, when I really look at it, this one act saved my life because when I went to prison, I didn't trust anybody. So I took an act that happened when I was 10 years old and turned it into a thing that was survival. So when I went to prison, you couldn't get close to me. I would let you so close. I'd make friends, you know. I made guys like me, you know, but I wouldn't let you get too close to me. You couldn't give me coffee or anything. Like, I knew it was like, no thanks, I want nothing from you. I made acquaintances, but I very rarely got close to people. I got close enough to have people support me and want to protect me. The good thing about a guy like me is, like, there's always... Guys like me have a lot easier time in prison than guys like 5'8", 5'9", guys. Because guys like me, people, there's always a bigger bully. You beat a guy like me up, what do you prove? So there's always one guy more saying, dude, anyone can pick up a little guy in the yard, why don't you try me out? And if I wasn't, like, you know, a jerk, if I wasn't a jerk, people would be good. I'm serious. That, I mean, it was a survival. But I also didn't trust people. I was hyper aware of not letting people get too close to me. Right? So then it says, though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person entirely. Where were we to blame? Now, that's a question. Some people say it's a rhetorical question. And I'm okay with that if you don't do it. But I like looking at it. Where am I to blame? Now, some people say, well, you're to blame on these things here. I get it. It's, and it's, you know what? It's not even, I don't even care. I don't even argue it. I like to ask the question, where am I to blame? There's a question mark behind it, so I ask the question, where am I to blame? Not forgiving. And I remember talking to my sponsor and saying, you know what? And he said to me, he said, you know, Brian, you're going to have to get to a place where you forgive. And I said, you know what? It's impossible. There's no way I could ever forgive this person. And he said, you're, you're right. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I just said, no, you're right. There's absolutely no way you could forgive. He said, but maybe through the relationship you have with God, that God can give you the power to help you forgive. Because of your own power, you will never forgive this man for that. And I got it. I'd never given this to God. I'd never truly brought this to God. And you know why? For me, I didn't want to forgive. Because somehow I associated forgiveness... With, then it was okay. Like it was okay. It made it okay. It's never okay. It's never okay to touch a kid. It will never be okay. But I can forgive and get free and let him live with that. He has to live with that. It was like I cut the shackles. Boom! Shackles were cut and I was free. And I'm free. And guess who still has the shackles? He still lives with that. He's still haunted by that. Let him own it. I'm free. And years later, well, we're going to get into six and seven, but I, I will tell you the story because it is connected to this. Years later, when I was, uh, years later, when I was in the prison, the guy, I told you yes, I kind of told you a little bit of the story about the guy who asked me for help. Let me tell you how it went down. It was connected to this. I really believed I was free. I really did. I truly believe I'm free. And probably five, six years later, I'm doing work in the prison. And I'm doing work, uh, you know, like taking guys through the book. And there was 
guys come to AA meetings in there who were child molesters, and you know, there was a whole realm. And I, I was kind of like, but I found myself hanging out or going to the guys who were like armed robbery, you know, assault with a deadly weapon, maybe OUIs, you know, like vehicular homicide. Guys, I would, I would somehow become more friendly with them, and the guys who had crimes, like sex crimes, I kind of stayed away from. Even though I would say I didn't have an opinion on it and I was free of this, I found myself in looking looking later, I would do that. But what happened is, I took these three guys through, the one guy failed, I took the other two guys through the steps. One guy was doing a manslaughter case, I took him through the book, and the other guy was a serial rapist, and it was kind of a faulty charge, but whatever, he had that. And I really didn't care, like I was just taking, I don't, like I don't sponsor murderers, and I don't sponsor rapists, I sponsor alcoholics, that's just what I do. But this guy walks up to me, who I know from the Amy, who has a ch he's child molest. He, he molested both his kids. And I know, I mean, they talk about it, and I hear it. So I know him. He walks up to me, and he saw these other two guys start to get free. I was going to start a new group. And he said, hey, I want to be in your new group. Will you sponsor me? And I, uh, I said to him, you know what, I'll think about it. And I knew when I said it, I was wrong. I knew as soon as I said it, I was wrong. But I said it, and he said, okay, and he walked away. And I walked out of prison that day, and as I was walking out the doors, when they were slamming behind me, they slammed real loud that day. And I got out to my parking lot, and I started crying, I started thinking, God, you know, I made this commitment to God that I would work with his kids, and he sent me one of his kids, and it was, I don't think he tested me, but it was like, you really trust me, you really want to help my kids, well then you got to help my kids, mm -hmm. and I walked away from one of his children, and I called my sponsor, and I said, I was so ashamed, I said, you know, even today, when I was six, seven years sober, I was just a baby in AA, but I said to him, I said, you know, I was crying, he said, what's up, I said, dude, I just did something, I violated a principle, like I turned my back on one of God's kids, dude. And he just listened to me. And he could feel the pain. And he knew enough about me that he didn't need to scold me. He didn't need to say anything harsh. But he did say this. He said, you know, he said, uh, that's really unfortunate. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go back in next Friday and tell him I'll sponsor him. He said, yeah, I think that's the right thing to do. He said, you know what I think I really like about this whole event? I said, I don't know. What do you like about it? <laughs> he says, uh... I like the fact that you can't go in for a week and you have to sit with this for a week. <laughs> and he was right, because in meditation that whole week, I felt constantly not worthy of God's love. And I was constantly saying, I'm so sorry. I will never do that again. And I went back in and I sponsored that guy. And I'm going to tell you, I listened to his fifth step, and, uh, and I did it with grace and dignity and integrity. I did not judge the man. I actually, I never really liked him. I never got to a place where I truly liked him, but I loved him enough that he got free. I loved him enough. And when he died, he died of cancer like three years later, I knew that I did what God would ask me to do. I gave him enough dignity. His demons that sit inside of him were way more torturous than anything I was going to give him. And what happened for me is I got completely free of this. I thought I was free, but I was not truly free. And after I listened to his fifth step and had make amends, and after that whole process started, I was completely free. And I no longer, like, I'm real clear. I mean, I got kids. So, like, the truth is there are certain people that I'm never going to let around my kids. Like, i got to protect my kids. My whole job is to protect my kids. I'm not delusional. But it's irrelevant. And I got free. And I, you know, and I have sponsored a lot of guys in there. And not all of them have sex, and a lot of them don't. But I sponsor a lot of them, and they know I don't judge them. When I listen to their fifth step, it doesn't really matter. And if you're a good sponsor when you can just sit there and listen. Because they're all looking for the judgment. They're looking for, like, whoa, what? No. <laughs> and uh, I'm forever grateful for that moment. Even though, and that's how I think God can take. A moment when you really fail and you really fall short. Because it's never the mistake that's going to get you drunk, right? Just know that. Making mistakes does not get you drunk. 
justifying them, rationalizing them, hiding them, covering them up. That's what gets you drunk. The actual mistake will not get you drunk. It's when I justify the behavior and I just I keep doing it over and over. So I got I, I got all this done. I'm gonna tell you, I did all resentments against the guy who ratted me out to the feds. Uh, my mom. I found out my mom. My mom didn't write me a letter disowning me. I made my mom write me a letter. I basically put a pen in my mom's hand and made her write me a letter. I basically said, "Here, write your write your youngest boy and disown him." I went into that resentment a victim, came out of it a victimizer. Realized that I made my mom do something that every parent dreads. And when I made amends to my mom on that, I'm telling you, when I made amends to my mom, she told me, she said this. She said, uh, <laughs> she said to me, I'll never forget, it was like brutal for me. She said, you know, Brian, uh, cause I made my amends and there's what I did. Why, is there anything you want to say? She said, oh, I got lots to say. I'm like, okay. So I sat down with my mom. Now, my dad, I did separately, did my parents separately. I was taught to do that. And I made all amends, all the money I was paying her back. And she said, you know, I just want to say something that when I wrote you that letter in prison, she said, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do. That was harder than burying your brother. And that got my attention. And I go, Okay, and I listened, I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, how? I don't get how that was harder than Barry and Chucky. And I said, I'm not denying it, I just don't get it. Can you help me? And she said, look, she said, when Chucky got leukemia, she goes, it was 1967. The death rate for children with leukemia was like 85%. She goes, me and your dad knew what was coming. Like, it was a really small chance that he was going to survive, especially with the leukemia he had. She said, so with us, we put Chucky in the care of the doctors. We knew we couldn't help him. But with you, I'd write the letter, and I'd put it in the mailbox, and I would sit there drinking a cup of coffee, and I'd run back out to the mailbox and pull it out of the mailbox. I did that for five days. Five days, I put the mailbox, the letter in, and five days, I pulled it out. And on the sixth day, on Saturday, your dad put his hand on my shoulder and said, let it go. It's just, I think I cried harder that day than I did when we buried Chucky. Because I grieved for Chucky way before we buried him. But it was like I was burying my youngest son. And so this lie that I run around with, which was, you know, let's just get off my back and leave me alone because I'm not hurting anything but myself. It's a lie. Now, I would have never have seen that final right inventory because I went into it. My mom, my mom victimized me. She disowned me. Who does that to a kid? And then the flip is, who does that to a mom? And so I got free of that. And uh, then I was to write fear inventory. And I'm not going to get much into fear. I'm not even going to write how fear. I'm just going to move past. But I will tell you that fear inventory, what I learned, I, there's lots of different ways to write fear inventory. You can write on tons of different ways. I write fear inventory uh, like I do resentment now. You know, I write the fear. I write how, when I'm in it, how it affects me. And then I write where I'm being selfish, dishonest, self-seeking. And where am I blaming? Where I'm to blame all my fears is I don't trust and rely upon God anymore. And what I learned around fear is that fear of what other people think about me took me to a place where I robbed banks. Now, that's a stretch, right? I mean, I, I don't know how... You think about that. I didn't get that until I wrote my fear inventory, and I realized that I'm so invested in how people think about me that when I was in my financial worst, when I owed all this money to all these drug dealers, and I'd taken the rent money from my roommates, and I used it to re-up on an eight ball, and I then smoked it all, and everything was coming troubling. Now, instead of me saying, hey, guys, I stole the rent money, and telling these drug dealers, they weren't going to hurt me. They were just friends. You know, they weren't really dangerous guys. Me going to them and saying, you know, I know I got an ounce fronted, but I smoked that up, and getting clean and saying, I got, I need help with cocaine. Instead of doing that, I went and robbed the bank to keep the lie going. And I was tormented. The night I robbed the bank, I tried to kill myself. The night right before I robbed the bank, I was out in the desert with my roommate's car, pumping fumes into the, into the car. So it wasn't a robbery like I planned it out. And, you know, my first robbery, I got $50. 
Fifty dollars, my first bank robbery. It's ridiculous. I don't even say that with any pride. And it's because I asked for it. That's what I did. I, I seriously, I went up to, I wrote a note, you know, on the back of a note. I wrote, you know, I, I went up, you know, when you go up and you fill out your slips, I just turned it over and I said, I have a gun. Uh, give me fifty dollars or I'll kill you. And then I stood in line. And I waited. Then she said, next. I said, oh hey, it's me. And I kind of gave her the note and and she like looked at it and gave me a fifty dollar bill and I ran. So I, you know, it wasn't a planned out thing. It was all based on this. I know it's ridiculous. Dude. This was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I robbed another bank about two hours later, but I still. But the point is this. I went out to kill myself that night because I, I felt like a total failure. And then halfway through all this, like, fumes coming in and I was writing letters. I started writing letters to my mom and I realized, man, I can't do this to my mom. And I walked around the desert all night trying to figure out what my problem was. And because I don't really figure out problems good, I figured out my problem was lack of money. And if lack of money is a problem, there's only one solution. <laughs> yeah, money. So I just went out and robbed the bank the next day. And I robbed my parents' bank because I you know, felt safe. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know me, but you know, I knew my parents' bank there. Yeah. And then that, I robbed that, I got 50 bucks, ran to my roommate's car, drove to 7-Eleven, bought a 12-pack of Budweiser, drank about four of them to get the thing done. And then I got like, oh my God, I just robbed the bank. So I drove all the way across town and robbed another bank. The second bank I robbed, FBI was doing a bank robbery uh, seminar there, and they got the call for the first bank robbery, and they left to go to the first bankery, and then I went and robbed that bank. <laughs> <laughs> they thought they they didn't they were freaking out. They thought it was like, what's going on here? And then six months later, I robbed another one, and then uh, two weeks after that one, you know, my picture was all over the news, and somebody said, hey, I know that guy. And then I got up down the down and I did another one. But the truth, what I found in my favorite story is like, I'm so invested in what you think about me, that I'm willing to give up my freedom to keep the lie going. I do want to talk about one thing in fear. If you go to page 68. So I write in fear inventory. One of the reasons I don't write fear inventory here is just because of lack of time, but I find how to write. It's, it's, it doesn't really matter to me how you write. It's all pretty easy. I, the key for fear is this. We go to the last paragraph, right above where it says, Now by six says, We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages of faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let Him demonstrate through us what He can do. What does that say? Remember the third step we talk about we bear witness? Right? That's, that's what they're talking about right there. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. So I took every fear after I wrote it out, and I took it all into that prayer. What he would have me be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. There's a difference between not having it and outgrowing it. Okay? So when I came into this world, I mean, here's fear. And then we'll end. We'll, we'll have a break, and then I'll do sex and fifth step, and maybe six and seven. But here's the deal. Everybody, I mean, fear's a natural emotion. Everybody has it. In fact, the very first emotion you get is fear. Like, just picture me. I'm sitting all in this nice warm bath. Everything's great. I got room service coming in. I'm just a little tiny thing. And room service every day. And I'm warm. And all of a sudden, like, my earth starts shaking. And I'm like, whoa. And then all of a sudden, I get shot down this canal. And like, hey. And then some guy grabs me by the feet. <laughs> Pulls me up, slaps me on the ass, it's bright lights and everything. I mean, that's my first, like, introduction to the world. I mean, I was all safe and happy one minute. And next thing I know, I got some weird guy slapping me on the butt. And they're, like, shaking me around and stuff. Can't wait to get to my mom. I don't even know what's going on. I mean, that's our first reaction. Doesn't that sound a little frightening? I mean, it sounds frightening to me, but that's really how it is. I mean, fear is a natural response. It's what we're, I mean, it's what keeps us, from, like, driving off cliffs. You know, fear is what stops us from really killing ourselves. So it's in that you will always have fear. But when fear dominates us and it paralyzes us, it's a problem. The fears that kill me are not the, the, the silly feels. Fear of what people think of me. Fear of being judged. Fear of being liked. Fear of not being. Here's what guys do. Most guys are like this. Fear of not being respected. The fear of not being respected led me to a lot of fights, and I got my butt beat a lot of times. In fact, I would take a whooping just to be respected. 
I was the type of kid on the playground, you would beat me down. And then as you walked away, I would come running up behind you and jump on your back and bite you in the ear. And I knew I was going to get a beating. But so what? Guess who got the respect in the neighborhood? I got a lot of respect. That was crazy. When they wanted to break into a school, guess who was willing? The first guy to raise his hand and say, I'll do that. Me. Still on bikes at the age of 10, 11. My brother. My brother was 14. He'd say, and in front of his buddies, he'd say, hey, Brian, if you take a bike home from school today, uh, I'll give you five bucks. I didn't take it. I did it for the money. But really why I did it was when I would ride up with someone else's bike and I'd give it to my brother. Like, man, your little brother's crazy. That's all I needed to hear one time. Your little brother's crazy, man. He's got big ones. <laughs> Seriously. That's because I'm so not okay with who I am. Your validation of you defines me. Which led me to a lot of problems. So I still have fears, but here's the difference. When I came into AA, this was, here's my faith down here. Now I'm not, you can have fear and, fear and faith at the same time. You just gotta understand that. Like, Lack, lack of fear, you know, I mean, it's different. People will say, you can't have fear and faith. I think you have to have both. In fact, faith allows me to walk through all my fears, all right? When I walked in, this was my fear, and this was my faith. It was like a big black shadow. And as I've got sober, the longer I've stayed sober, it's gone the other way. I've outgrown, I've outgrown my fears. So my faith is so much larger than my fears. Doesn't mean I don't get afraid. Doesn't mean I don't have doubt. Doesn't mean I don't second guess myself. Doesn't mean, you know, when I started having kids, man, I, my first kid, I was like, oh my God, what do you do? How do you raise what do you, a kid? Oh my Lord. First time I let you out of the hospital, I'll never forget that. They're like, okay, you can leave now. I'm like, whoa, what? We gotta leave with the kid? Are you kidding? You know, like we're just comfortable here. Three days later, we gotta go home? It doesn't make sense. I did a, a parent ideal. You can talk about sex ideal after break. My buddy Chip said, you know, I was writing inventory, I said, I got a lot of fear on having my daughter, like, I didn't know if my daughter, but having a child, and I said, what are you afraid of? I said, I don't know, what I don't even know what kind of parent I'm going to be. He says, why don't you write a parent ideal like you did a sex ideal? So I wrote this parent ideal of what type of dad I wanted to be. He said, now ask God, do you grow into that? What a novel idea. And when I look at it, I'm telling you, if you're sponsoring guys who are going to be fathers, have them do it, because it'll be good. And my wife did one, so we both have an idea of what type of parents we want to be. We immediately saw if there was going to be any conflicts. So my kids are raised by two parents who really put effort into what we wanted to be as parents. And we still have a lot of fear around it all. Because they're kids, they're babies. I mean, you know, we want to protect them. So this is where I want to get. I want to outgrow my fear. I know that I'm never going to absolutely be free of fear. I know it's going to be around as it is supposed to be. It keeps me from hanging around Martin Luther King Boulevard looking for ice cream. <laughs> With my kids. Hey, there's ice cream shop. Let's go. You know, that, that, I, just, I know. Martin Luther King Boulevard. Cesar Chavez, same thing in Austin. You know, don't go down Cesar Chavez at nighttime. Nothing, just... I love Martin Luther King. But if you look at Martin Luther King Boulevards, most of them... <laughs> most of them... Most of them are in the ghetto. I, I'm just telling you, it's, it's not a bad, I, I think it's Rock. Chris Rock did a great joke about that. But it's true. But take out the word, it doesn't matter. I'm just talking about going around neighborhoods I should be going around at nighttime with my kids. That's okay. Dude, I can rumble with you. It's kind of big, but I like big guys. I'm fishy. Let's do this. Let's take a 10 minute break. We're going to do sex inventory and at 5, 6, and 7. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.